am so happy to be here tonight because I was sick last week and didn't get to come, so thank you so much for coming tonight. And people tell me I don't speak loud enough, so can you hear me? Are we okay? Well, um, people always ask, how did two little Christian girls from rural backgrounds decide to do a Holocaust exhibit? And um, I'm always taken back by that because to me it's not just the, the Jewish thing, it's for mankind. Well, um, in 2005, Becky Seitel was attending a Holocaust program in Temple Bethel in Birmingham, Alabama. And she had never heard a Holocaust survivor speak. I happened to be sitting behind her in that program because I had gone with a friend of mine whose mother was a Holocaust survivor and I thought, well, I'm going to show support and I'm going to go to this program. When, when Becky left the program, she was so touched by what she heard, she thought, you know, I need to preserve these stories because my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren will never hear a Holocaust survivor. So I think I know my community project. So as she and her husband were leaving, she said, Alan, I know what I want to do. He, said, he asked her, have you found your community project? She, she said, yes, I found my community project. Well, I was having an art show a couple of months later, and she walks up to me and she asked me if I could have dinner with her and we could talk about a project. And I'm like, sure, sure. You know how people will mention things and time passes and you're like, oh, sure, sure, someday. Well, Becky is the kind of person that if she says she's going to do something, boy, she schedules it, it's on the calendar, and she gets it done, which is really good because if it were up to me, I would still be painting. So we had to have, you know, some closure. Um, so Becky and I uh, met with the Birmingham Holocaust Education Center, that's what it was called then. We presented an idea, and Denise, you may have been there that day uh, that we presented the idea. We wanted to document Holocaust survivors' stories through paintings and photographs and then the, have the narratives. And um, the center decided that they thought it was a good project. So they contacted the Holocaust survivors in the Birmingham area and we were given a list of names. Well then we set about um, interviewing the people. And I will tell you, I was so nervous. I thought, can I ask the questions and can I, can I really do this? This is such a serious subject. So uh, were any of you here last week and, and heard Max Steinmetz speak? Okay. Max was one of the first people we went to to see what he thought about it. And he, you know, Max in that very, very uh, uh, astute accent goes, I think it's a good idea. So we, we thought, okay, we're going to go forward with this. So we started the interviewing process, and um, we got our little tape recorder, and we recorded the first interview, and it was just hours and hours of information. Um, we interviewed Ruth Ziegler, and we had all this priceless information. So the second interview was Elsa Nathan, her sister. And we were just so excited about all the wonderful information we had. Well, we had taped over Ruth. So, you know, we, we did everything backwards. We, we learned. <laughs> we were definitely not professional. And we even questions, questioned ourselves, you know, like I said, okay, I have paint, I have canvas, Becky has a camera and film. Are we the people to do this? And we decided that, okay, I said, I may not be the best artist. Becky says, I may not be the best photographer, but by George, we're going to do this. We're going to capture these stories. And I will tell you that as we sit down with each survivor, and I was telling Denise this in the car on the way here, I, we would sit across the, from them in their kitchen table. And for example, Martin Aaron is telling us his story. It's an amazing story. And he uh, looks at me and he goes, tears are running down his eyes, and he goes, oh my goodness, I haven't thought about that in 60 years. That memory was completely gone. So it was like a floodgate opening for these people, and we took notes, there was so much information, 
And then it was like, well, how do we take all this information and put it into a few pictures and a few narratives? It was a real challenge. But I will tell you that as I left each interview, I pretty much had an idea of the subject that I was going to be um, painting and writing about. There would be just an instant that stood out. And when I go over the paintings with you, I'll give you some of those examples. So this uh, little, pro little project that we were working on started getting some attention from people in the community. And the interest started growing and growing. And one of the advertising agencies, Sla the Slaughter Group, started donating their time. So as we're prepping this exhibit, getting it ready, we're on TV stations, we're on radio stations, we're in the newspaper. And so the interest was growing and growing and we, could, we felt the importance of what we were doing. Um, so I will tell you, and are there art students in here tonight? Okay. You know all the research that you do, and for example, uh, Ruth Ziegler's painting, Prowse Welcoming Committee. Um, I spent hours, hours researching those guns, okay? But when you actually sit down to paint the picture, you put a line. You just put a basic line, right? You don't have to put everything about the gun. So I learned that I didn't have to spend 20 hours researching the gun, you know. But I did want to be honest and accurate with our details. What, one thing Becky and I did not want to do is we didn't want to add to and we didn't want to take away. We wanted to be honest with history. So um, we finished the first, there, there's phase one and phase two of this exhibit. We finished phase one, which was uh, nine Holocaust survivors from the Birmingham area. Uh, we opened the exhibit April 1st, 2007. And uh, I think it's just kind of funny, April 1st. But anyway, we had, we had um, a lot of publicity because of this advertising agency. And we had 1,700 people show up for that exhibit. And that was 39 painting, a combination of 39 paintings and photographs. And uh, it was just overwhelming. It really was the interest. Well, then we got the opportunity, we, we were asked by the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute if we would exhibit the following year in their, their venue. Well, of course we wanted to, but they wanted more survivors. They wanted more than the nine survivors from Birmingham. So Becky and I get our little temperamental tape recorder and we travel the state. We were able to add 11 more Holocaust survivors to the exhibit, um, a uh, survivor out of Mobile, one of, out of Opelika, uh, two in Huntsville, one in Montgomery, and the rest in Birmingham. And what happened with this phase two is we were able to bring so much more in to the exhibit that we didn't have. In phase one, you don't see a painting of Hitler. I didn't do a painting of Hitler. But in phase two, there was a story from Sonia Bromberg about seeing Hitler on the street and how it scared her. She had never, she was a little girl, she had never heard his name, but there was this crowd in the street and there was all this excitement. And she was talking about, she looks up at him and she sees what she called a face of evil. Now this is a child, so it was the perfect opportunity for me to bring in Hitler. Well, I didn't want to paint Hitler looking good, you know, okay. I didn't think he should look so good. But in all of the photographs and all of the film, he was immaculate. His hair was perfect. His mustache was perfect. His nails were perfect. His clothes were perfect. So I had to paint him perfect. So anyway, but don't you think in a Holocaust exhibit you really need Hitler in there somewhere? The other thing that happened was... Um, when I first started uh, painting these pictures, I did everything in oil. And as you know, artist, when you paint in oil, doesn't it take it a long time to dry? Oh, it's terrible. It teaches you patience. 
So you put a layer of oil down, and you wait a week, and you put another layer of oil down, and you wait another week. Well, by that time, you're already behind schedule. So something I wanted to point out, some of the first um, paintings I did were in oils. And people ask me, Mitzi, you know, there's so many different styles in this exhibit. It doesn't look like one artist did it. I did that for two reasons. To break the monotony, okay? And the other thing was, this is my true style. It's called expressionism. It's a thick buildup of paint, a lot of movement. And in this story, um, Ruth, it's called Prowl's Welcoming Committee because Ruth was taken, uh, it's toward the latter part of her experience. Ruth and her sister Elsa were taken to um, a camp called Proust. And one of the things we did want to bring out in this Holocaust exhibit, it wasn't that, it, that the Nazis just wanted to kill everybody. They wanted to torture people too. They wanted to watch people suffer. And in this particular story, they get off the truck transport and the soldiers tell them to march up um, a mound of dirt. And you know, these girls had been through so much and they thought, oh no, we're going to be shot and we're going to fall to our death. Nobody's going to ever know our story. Nobody will ever know what happened to us. So they march them up there and the soldiers are fumbling around and everything and um, with their guns and not acting serious. And after a while, they tell the girls that they can leave. They were torturing them. But I have to tell you a little side note about this is I'm Christian. So when Ruth told me that they were standing at the top of the mound and they were praying, I paint, you know, I painted their hands doing this. They all had their hands doing this. So when I took it to her, um, she said, oh no. She said, you know, when Jewish people pray, we just, we don't do our hands like that. And I went, oh no, well I've got to correct that. She said, I want you to keep some with their hands up though because not everybody was Jewish. And some of them might have had their hands like this. So I just thought that was kind of interesting because um, they were not all Jewish. And it was just that, People pray, but it's in a different way. Just because I perceived it a different way doesn't mean that it wasn't a good way to pray. She had a different way to pray. And um, in this particular picture, and as you'll see, we have narratives with these pictures. My original intent was to do everything abstract with just form and color and create a mood. Well, I could tell early on that that form and color was really not going to tell the story. So I had to set that artist's ego aside, which is really hard sometimes, and say, okay, this art is going to tell the story. It's not going to be a personal art show for me, okay? So when I get into different paintings, you'll see some in pastel because as time was approaching for the Civil Rights Institute uh, show, I was running out of time. So this is done in pastel, and um, some of the things about this painting is Elsa had had her sh head shaved. It was a form of torture. They were torturing her. But in this, this liberation painting, Elsa and Ruth were escaping, and they talk about the cornfield that they were hiding in. Well, when I went back to that time of the year, it was last year's cornfield, so it wouldn't have been this lush cornfield. It would have been just a few stalks. And I did, I used colors that show energy because they told me, even though they were so weak, that they had this burst of energy that they were running across this field and they were going to be free. So in art, we can do all that play with, with color and energy. And quickly, to show you some of the things about Becky's um, Photographs, um, you know, the simple, simple things became the most important things. A simple bowl. You were given a bowl when you went to the concentration camp. If you lost that bowl, you would have no soup. You would have no food. 
And you had to sleep with that bowl inside your clothes at night so it wouldn't be stolen. If someone died, people were scrambling around for that bowl. So here Becky is talking about a prized possession was a simple bowl. And then we talk about, uh, Ruth talks about clean sheets. You know, we take it all so for granted. We live in this sterile world with our washing machines and our dryers and all that. They lived in such filth and such horrible conditions that when they were free and they were able to eventually get back to some of the family, the most important thing was smelling the clean sheets. A simple, simple thing like that. And then this is showing Elsa and some of the things that she's involved in today. She is involved in a knitting class where they knit for um, knit hat caps and scarves for people with cancer. And in this, it's, it shows a portrait of Elsa's mom and a baby and also the tattoo on Elsa's arm. And it's symbolic of uh, Lador Fedor, generation to generation. So just a little bit about those, those pictures. Um, in, in phase one, I did a before the Holocaust painting I did a during a Holocaust moment, and then I did the point of liberation. Uh, Becky did three photographs. When we got to phase two, we didn't have as much time. So when you're noticing on the panels, and you see one painting and one photograph from, from those survivors, it doesn't mean they're less important. It means that's the, the final 11 we did, and we only had a year to do it. <laughs> But anyway, it's called Reflections of Shabbat. So I'm sketching a painting of a family at a table. And Shabbat's very important in uh, Judaism. It's something that Elsa and Ruth enjoyed at the end of every week. So I sketch out this um, picture, and it is so boring. It just shows people sitting at a table. So I happened to get a Hallmark card. You know, Hallmark sends these wonderful cards. And I saw these candlesticks with reflections, not of people, but just reflections of the room. So if you look at this close enough, you'll see the reflections of the family in the candlesticks. And it just, and then we give a narrative that tells you a little bit about Shabbat and what goes on. Um, one of the things that we wanted to do in this exhibit, because we could overwhelm you with information, is to take a moment, recreate that, and have you um, be involved with that and understand it. Papa's car was about Ruth Ziegler and she had this wonderful, wonderful experience of every Friday her father would take her for a drive in the car. So in Ruth's case, most cases we did not have photographs where we could copy how they looked or see how things, you know, were. But Ruth's family had paperwork to leave Germany and um, they sent trunks of pho photographs ahead to their relatives in the United States. And um, there was one piece, uh, there was one question that was not answered on Ruth's father's papers. So they were not allowed to go and get on the ship. So we, have, we had lots of pictures. So I had a picture of how Ruth looked as a child. I even had a picture of how her father's car looked. Um, so this memory was, just a fun memory. It was just a simple riding in a car with her dad and it's Friday afternoon and they're delivering kosher meat to various members of the family and then other meats they would do, they would donate it to the needy. But I just thought that was just a sweet picture and somebody can see that's just a little girl enjoying being with her dad. Um, I have to tell you this is the photograph that Becky took. It's called Together. Um, some of our Holocaust survivors were on the cattle trains. Some were not. You know, there's, there's a variety of experiences. Some were in the death camps. Some were in the labor camps. Some were orphans hidden out as Catholic children. Even some of them were able to escape at the last minute and come to America. So there's a variety of stories from all the different people. But anyway, Becky Seitel decides that she's going to take a, a photograph of Ruth and Elsa at the train tracks because that's one of the stories that haunts them.
to this day. They were forced to get on the cattle cars. They rode in you know, terrible conditions and uh, then separated from their family. So Becky calls the railroad company and she's trying to find out you know, when do trains come through because she doesn't want them standing on the train track with a train coming. And because of 9-11 and security, they could not pinpoint an exact time. But they told her between, I think it's 4 and 5 o'clock on an, a particular afternoon. So Becky and her husband and Elsa and Ruth are standing on the train tracks, and they're not paying any attention. That All of a sudden, Alan says, ladies, off the track. They barely got off the track because it was a curved area. And they're like, and Becky was so scared, she goes, oh, I've terrorized these two, two poor Holocaust survivors. So Ruth turns to Becky and said, you know, Becky, Hitler didn't kill us, but you almost did. So, you know, there's a little, little humor in there, too. But one thing that, you, that we hope that you really gather from this certainly is the history of uh, these experiences. You get to know them a little bit one-on-one. -on -one. You see that they're people. It's not... When you hear six million people died, a million and a half babies were killed, it's overwhelming. It's hard to take all that in. So our goal was to make it really, pers you know, really, really personal with you. So uh, I don't want to take up too much of Denise's time, but that's just kind of behind the scenes. And I'm going to be in the gallery area and after Denise's speech, and I'm happy to give you a little more insight, tell you some of the behind the scenes stories and answer any of your questions. So thank you.